Welcome to Culture Road for another episode. Uh, Phil and Angela, how are you doing, guys? This is... Uh, yeah, I'm getting in there. Good. Um, sorry, you know, we, we didn't have a lot uh, of preparation for this one, but um, we're going to go through it anyway. We have a couple of things to go through. Um, I'm so back. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy about uh, uh, now this episode because... We get to talk about uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and all those things that happened this week. It was one of the most, uh, to me, interesting uh, 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 things that happened. The fact that um, he lost $6 billion within, uh, within just hours and uh, you know, all of his uh, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, Book and Instagram shut no, shut down completely. Following um, the testimony by by the whistleblower, uh, how did you guys see it? Um, how did we see the? I mean, I didn't see her speaking. I mean, I <clears throat> I heard it was. Uh, I know there was a lot on sixty minutes and everything, but I mean, I understand the the gist of what she was saying, which is pretty devastating. I think. Um. Kind of though confirming what a lot of people have suspected for some time that that Facebook is uh, really um, passively, if not actively, contributing to the spread of dangerous misinformation, conspiracy theories, etc., um, and that you know um, Instagram uh, is contributing to the, um, the the low self image of of teenage girls in particular. And as the parent of two teenage boys, um, I can figure you know I'm not surprised by that because. Uh, it's in the nature of the beast, so to speak, I think in both cases. But this is the first time we've really had it out there that basically um, the company is aware of this kind of thing and has just decided not to do anything about it because they're afraid it might hurt their profits. We've seen this kind of thing before with the tobacco companies, with the oil companies, you know, so it's, it's always the same thing. These bastards get together and just basically are in this culture where they say that uh, I'm it just it's it's amazing how insulated they are but they just feel as long as the money is coming in um then however destructive their products they're just going to put that put that aside and and uh, in the name of profit it's uh it's really disgusting um i don't know what's going to come of it but we can look at this as maybe the first um you know the first shot in an ongoing war to bring these social media companies into line and insist that with the kind of responsibility they have, you know, um, I mean, with the kind of power they have, I should say, uh, they have to use it responsibly or face the consequences. Yes, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I think right now is the most powerful man in the world, given yes. the fact that he controls uh, what we see, what we read, what how we think. Now, let me just delineate uh, the problems and, and then I'm gonna go to you, uh, Angela. First of all, Facebook is being accused by the insiders, and this is not the first one, of the, the scientists. This is the, uh, the, uh, that Facebook um, deliberately, deliberately through its algorithms, uh, uh, deliberately uh, um, wants everybody, wants us to be uh, promote extreme views. It promotes extreme views because <clears throat> basically they're playing on our emotions that it's so easy to get people on the edge because that's the only way they can read uh, uh, Facebook. You can actually have a lot of FaceTime. And that's how they make their money through advertising. So the more you use Facebook, the more they make their money. And the only, the only way to use Facebook more is by getting you uh, basically just up. Secondly, WhatsApp is used for not only misinformation, but disinformation. And Facebook knows this all the time. The videos that are viral videos that usually go out from, you know, on, on WhatsApp. And this is even worse because WhatsApp is the only mode of communication for so many people outside of the United States. Just about you can you know, call without having to pay all that uh, phone bill. And a lot of people are doing that. All my family members use WhatsApp. All the schools have WhatsApp 
the other kids. I, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a member of uh, my my brother's uh, kid is in high school in Kenya, and he put me on that list. So I know what is going on uh, in the high school. So what I they, what happens is that they, all these high schools around the world have these uh, WhatsApp groups. And it's not just that, it's a lot of other people who are not even in high school. So that is a WhatsApp problem. Viral uh, uh, videos that are actually wrong or they're meant to rile up people or they're meant to misinform and disinform. And then you have Instagram. Instagram is making teenage girls um, have uh, problems with themselves, how they look. But not only is it that doing that, if you look at uh, um, um, Instagram, uh, it's also promoting uh, um, um, sexual content. And uh, the kids have to, uh, the, the teenage girls have to uh, do a lot, a lot of these things uh, to be cool, and if they're not, of course, it it, it affects their own their own uh, emotions, their own uh, self worth, their psyche, and all those kind. Of so, if you think about it, the three companies that Mark Zuckerberg controls, they are not only eroding democracy, but they also saw sowing disinformation and bringing us to fight each other. And to an extent, they are part of a process that leads to teenage suicide among girls. So Angela, how, how, do, we, how, do, how do we get uh, to uh, regulate uh, Facebook and all the other companies associated with Mark Zuckerberg? I mean, give me your view, particularly on this thing of Teenage girls, and you know, you 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 uh, worked with uh, teenagers for quite some time. You know, uh, being a role model for them, you know, taught them. You know. And this is this is this is like uh, cutting down everybody from from the children to the adults. All the institutions are under attack by Facebook. Um, I have some various opinions about this. Okay, so I really didn't even know too much about the uh, social, med social media uh, outage because I'm just not on it that much. And um, I wasn't aware of it till like later on that night for me, which is probably still like um, uh, afternoon, early afternoon um, over in the States. So I was like, oh, okay. That doesn't stop my world from turning, but okay. Um, I think that um, with Mark Zuckerberg, I believe that he has way too much power in his hands. And he is definitely, in my opinion, in bed with a lot of politicians because he's making them money. He's not getting certain policies enacted and putting um, certain things in effect to restrict advertising companies, other businesses from putting certain type of um, marketing stuff online. OK, so I'm not removing a responsibility from him and what he's doing. However, I'm also not taking the responsibility off parents because people don't want to parent their children anymore. Um, I can remember growing up and no, we didn't have um, cell phones and all of that readily on, on hand, but my parents were really strict about, okay, you have a certain time period where you watch TV and you're only going to be watching certain things on TV. We didn't have TVs in our bedrooms. We didn't have the computers in our bedrooms. So they were very... Um, um, they monitored our actions until they got to a point that we were able um, to think more uh, present and readily for ourselves. And they trusted us enough to go off and do things for ourselves. So even now that plays off into just how I function and um, maneuver in my own life. But a lot of these parents don't want to parent. They are allowing the media to raise their children. They're allowing the um peer pressure to raise their children, the teachers to raise everybody but them. 
um, are raising their children. And that's a problem because, for example, one of my students that I just uh, that came over actually to visit me and this she's about 19 years old. She just turned 19 and she was ready to get out of the house and do her own thing. But she, we had to have like a whole come to Jesus meeting because she decided that she wanted to come over here to Italy and um, have sex with a grown a old man and lose her virginity. And I was like, um, sweetheart, what? And she was like, yeah, my mom, we, we've never talked about sex. And she, she didn't know about the female body. I had to bring out diagrams and everything. I was like, oh, my God, that's why I don't have children. Oh, my God, this is difficult. But because she had gotten so far, you know, now, you know, she's a, 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 an adult, basically. But there was a lot of things she didn't know because her mother and father felt too protective of her and they didn't feel comfortable having conversation with her because they didn't want to, um, for whatever reason, um, show their image and things that happened in their lifestyle, but that hasn't had an effect on her. And there were so many things that she was missing out on. And I was like, first of all, sweetheart, the fact that you want to come over and have sex with a 50 some year old man and you 19, first of all, he's a pedophile. Let's just talk about that. I'm going to call the cops on him just for that. But everybody else is raising their children but these parents. And I have a big, big problem with that. All right, listen, uh, you're absolutely right, Angela. And I mean, that's one reason why I sometimes I'm very thankful I don't have daughters, uh, because you have this extra dimension. Although, you know, uh, boys, too, have to bear some responsibility. And yes. it's and it's and listen, it's true that there's been this. <clears throat> You know, feminine sexting, um, girls uh, putting up these, you know, these uh, photos and videos of themselves because they think that's the way to be popular or get their boyfriends to stay with them or what have you. Uh, and and the parents parents have to play some role in this. And even as the parent of boys, you know, I've had tried to have discussions with them about kind of you know sexual responsibility, about the right way to you know treat women and so forth. Um, you know, using condoms, blah, blah, blah. I mean, not, not extensive, but I've always made it clear to them that if they have any questions, you know, come to me, we can talk about this without embarrassment. And, and you know, they've done that uh, when it's come up. Um, and I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, parents, sometimes the excuses made that, well, everybody's so busy and both parents are working. Come on, you can take some time out maybe from something you'd rather be doing, maybe binge watching or whatever the hell it is, okay? You gotta have these conversations or it's gonna come back to bite you. Now, now that said, um, we still can't, I don't think you can take Zuckerberg and his colleagues off the hook for this kind of thing. Because again, like in the political realm, they are making, they're raking in the big bucks and so they didn't wanna ask any questions about it. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, this is always the thing I'm not a, you know, I'm not a communist. I don't oppose capitalism, but I oppose unrestricted, what I call jungle capitalism, because unfortunately, you can't assume that every successful capitalist is a good guy or gal who is going to be concerned about the kind of product they put out and the impact of that product on the consumer. A lot of them don't give a rat's patootie about it. And Zuckerberg has just, you know, become the poster boy for that kind of thing. There yes. is. Interesting. Go ahead, Angela. No, no, I, I completely agree. They, um, <laughs> I think they're looking for somebody to be their scapegoat. Zuckerberg is uh, a political, allegedly. That is because uh, and, uh, that is the image that is promoted. But then uh, if you think about it, um, uh, I was reading somewhere that uh, Zuckerberg just got worse once he got in bed with I shouldn't say in bed, but uh, he got to be friends with Peter Thiel. Now, Peter Thiel is this allegedly li a libertarian individual. I, I usually call allegedly just because I'm not so sure how much these guys label themselves and how much true it is that they label themselves. I'm a libertarian. <clears throat> well, if you're a libertarian, in a, you know, I, di I didn't consider uh, Trump a libertarian. Uh, but uh, uh, but Peter Thiel is a good friend of of uh, Trump, and uh, he he's one of the investors, the initial investors uh, in Facebook. And uh, right now, he's one of the uh, most uh, um, 
um, powerful directors. So he's the one who um, basically walked him through the political uh, uh, situation in Washington and got him to meet Trump on many occasions. And he is also Peter Till, very much, um, uh, he knows a lot of Republicans, uh, Republican leaders in Congress. And so the point I'm trying to make is that there is this strain of libertarianism that uh, Zuckerberg is, uh, is basically pursuing with his companies. And the idea is to make money. The idea is to talk about uh, uh, liberty or personal liberty without any communal liberty. Um, the idea is basically to make sure that they can make as much money as they can while uh, you know, carrying this water you know, and talking about liberty, which is interesting given that liberty cannot operate, cannot be um, success, successful when they are in a situation where there are no laws. And laws have to be able to regulate human activity where human activity is bad in itself and people are falling apart in terms of on a political uh, level. I don't see how everything is going to work out well. And this is a fundamental problem with, with, with the Republicans and uh, not just Republicans, but libertarians. You can't have a society without laws, without rules. Because a society, a society without rules cannot function very well. Uh, nobody is going to respect your rights if there are no laws and if there are no uh, institutions. But they don't like institutions. Institutions are there to, uh, to support and to protect all of us. And the companies that he's running are basically rogue companies at this point. Um, and and, and um, I think something has got to be done. The problem, of course, is that they have um, a situation whereby the Democrats can't do anything because they're so timid. And uh, one of the things that we are seeing right now is that um, there is an atmosphere that has basically fallen over the United States. People are not feeling good. Uh, so it was a very temporary uh, euphoria we had with the election of Trump. Of, 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 uh, um. And so I, I think next year, uh, we may be back to the battleground in terms of fighting because there, there are no regulations that are going to be happening. That are of, of, uh, there, there will be some regulations because of the people that he has uh, appointed, but how long lasting are they going to be? There's not going to be any laws passed because the Republicans uh, understand that if that happens, you know, their friends are going to be losing. Well, I mean, let's see. First of all, I agree with you, George. I think <clears throat> I really don't see very much difference between, <clears throat> excuse me, libertarians and, and your garden variety uh, conservative Republicans, except for how that libertarians kind of uh, reject the, the influence of evangelicals and fundamentalist religion. Um, and they, um, you know, and they're pro-choice. I mean, beyond that, it's like, yeah, it's, it's really the same kind of thing. No restrictions, no regulations, uh, keep it minimal, let us operate the way we want to. And as I've said before, I mean, in some, to me, sometimes it's just a more sophisticated version of an eight-year-old going, you can't make me. I mean, this idea that I can do whatever I want, uh, it, you know, that wasn't even true in what people romanticize of the old West of like a hundred years ago. I mean, even then there were laws. I mean, it was it was harder to bring you know law and order to the prairies. We've seen so many uh, movies and TV shows on that theme. But even then, there was there was an effort to do that that was ultimately successful. There's never been a society. Uh, I mean, at least as long as there's been organized human civilization, you can't have society or civilization without some kind of laws, some kind of regulations. And I mean, the real debate is not between total freedom and total restriction. It's within that continuum, how much restriction, how much freedom. And as a society, it seemed 
for a long time that we had kind of worked that out to some degree. I mean, you know, you can't drive 200 miles an hour on the highway, even if your car goes 200 miles, you know, unless you're like uh, on a highway in Montana at 3 a.m. Otherwise, you can't do that. OK, you see a shiny object in a store window. You can't just smash the glass and take it. You see an attractive person. You can't just have sex with that person unless they agree to it. You know, yeah. these kinds of basic ideas. So it's it's an absurd position. But I do think that people like Teal use it to kind of particularly justify their economic uh, in, interests. And uh, this is clearly something that, um, that, yeah, I mean, that's that's a dangerous thing. If, he, if in fact, he has influenced Zuckerberg in that way, then um, that makes things even more toxic. But it's like, you know, what I always think about Facebook, it's interesting, is that I used to think of them as kind of maybe not the good guys, but less bad than some of the other things like Twitter, because at least on Facebook, you could, you know, uh, you could say something. I mean, you had more words, you could express yourself, you could put a link to an interesting article. It wasn't just like Twitter where, okay, 140 characters say the first stupid thing that came into your head or the first incendiary thing that came into your head. So, I mean, um, and the other thing I liked about Facebook was that it didn't seem to be so political at first. It was more about people putting up, you know, nice pictures of their pets and flowers and, you know, here was our vacation and wherever and all that. And, I, somewhere along the line, it morphed into this um, this kind of this atmosphere, this toxic atmosphere of putting out the most, as I say, provocative uh, uh, political comments, and you know, regardless of, of whether or not they're true. And it, listen, it happens on both sides. Let me just say that. I mean, I, one reason I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook is that very often when I see that somebody's put a post up there that I know, you know, and I check it. And the people who generally agree with me politically, and it's like, okay, great, you know, Trump is a bad guy, McConnell's a bad guy, blah, 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 okay. And then five other people will say, you're right, he's a bad guy, they're disgusting, blah, blah, blah. Okay, does that really enlighten us in any way? No. And, and, and you have this kind of echo chamber effect where people are just talking to each other, and I'm not the first person to say this, but you know, Facebook has heightened this kind of thing because it's an easy way for somebody to just get into this so-called community of people who agree with them and not try to listen to any uh, conflicting opinions. And it just means that we all become more hardened in our opinions, which makes any kind of dialogue and any kind of solution that much more difficult. So that's... Well, uh, the, 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 uh, Angela was talking about... Um personal responsibilities and how parental responsibility is actually lacking in many of these things. And, and that is true, but uh, Cheryl was, um, uh, Cheryl actually has been talking about this a lot. And one of the things that we have come to believe is that, and, 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 and I, I don't want to rile people up, but uh, uh, the millennials um, have a different, whole different you know, uh, way of dealing with things. And part of the reason this is happening, and not just the millennium, millennials, but people even below that, is the fact that um, our generation, our generation is the first generation to be super, super, super educated, super, super successful. Uh, I know generations before, some of them were, but it was not as big as, as our generation. It's a huge one. You know, our generation is the one that you know, came around, around from the 60s to, you know, to the 80s. Uh, and so you have this huge, huge cohort of people and they are super successful. And they are always, always thinking that they should do more to their, for their children. They're always sensitive. And so what you ended up with was basically cuddling children making sure that you no know, nothing wrong happens to them and so we we, we are very protective as uh, uh, as you said and uh, what we ended up with is a situation whereby uh there is little that is known of hard life uh so like you know, angela talked about the fact that a lot of time many years ago we, we didn't grow up with with the TV you know, in the bedroom or with the smartphones and all the uh, things like that. But right now, most of the kids do not believe that there was a world before uh, the internet, there was a world before Facebook, there was a world before Instagram. 
and, and, and it, it is very pathetic because it has given us this, um, this view of a world that is so, so fragile, a world that is so, uh, you know, uh, we, we're basically you know, like babies. We're not, we, we think that uh, everything is supposed to be easy or at least uh, the, this generation thinks everything's supposed to be easy. And so uh, things like how your body is becomes a big issue to you because your friends on Facebook and some of the friends they don't even know because it's not the way we used to have friends. And I, I had friends who were in school and uh, you, beat, uh, you fight and, and, and you do these things and stuff like that. These guys have virtual friends these days. You can actually just have a virtual friend and you know that's how you grow up. And you're thinking of how the friend who is virtual is thinking about you and that itself is enough to drive you to, to do something bad about yourself. It is something that we have to take responsibility now about. And I agree with you, Angela, on that. Now talking about uh, being, uh, you, you talked about uh, no regulation in terms of, uh, of uh, social media. How about abortion? All these conservatives and libertarians want women not to have abortion, not to have any right on their bodies. Until it happens to them. Until it happens. <laughs> And so, you know, there's this case last night, which was amazing, which was like an answer to the Supreme Court for allowing that Texas law to go on. You know, there, there was this uh, case yesterday where the, the district court judge in, in, in uh, Texas came up with a, an, an 100 page uh, decision, uh, a ruling that was very, very thorough and basically sided with the, the administration, basically sided with the Justice Department uh, in saying that the Supreme Court was wrong to allow that obnoxious Texas law to continue because right. that law deputized um, uh, uh, regulations, deputized the enforcement of another bad law on citizens. That has never happened. That, the, the, there can be never as bad a law as that because what this, that means is a, a law of the jungle. If anybody can sue and they're enticed to sue because if you sue, you get back uh, uh, $10,000 and you are legal fees and all those kind of things. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter who you are. You can just sue somebody else. There's no relationship between you and the person who has had an, uh, an abortion or a doctor who has con conducted an abortion. On, on somebody. That was a worst law. The problem with the Supreme Court is that if they allow that to continue on marriage, or even if they allow it to continue on, 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 uh, on uh, uh, um, other grounds, somebody else would want a different kind of law which they don't want to be executed that way. Now, here is the thing. So yesterday, the, this, uh, this judge said, Judge Pittman said, well, first of all, Texas cannot um, abridge a fundamental right. That's against the Constitution because the Roe v. Wade states very clearly that women have a right to their bodies with a few restrictions. <laughs> right. And this, the, this Supreme Court is looking to overturn that but they are trying to uh, look, uh, they're looking to overturn it cowardly. They're going to have to face the, the music and overturn it in broad daylight to say, uh, to say that there should never be any abortion and then wait to um, wait for the repercussions because I think a lot of people are going to be unhappy about it. So take it from uh, taking away, uh, Angela, this, the woman's right to choose or a woman's right to do whatever she wants with her body until a certain time. Yes. So my thoughts on all of this is just, is very antiquated. The fact that um, women still in 2021 are not given the respect, given the, 
competency, given so much to, to just govern their own body and do whatever, whatever the hell they want. Um, the fact that there's some women who they choose to have an abortion because they have visions and goals for their future. They don't want to derail their life and have a child brought into the situation. I'm not saying that um, having children is the curse. It might be a curse to some people. Um, I don't have any for a lot of different reasons, but that was a choice for me. Yeah. I wanted to pursue career, pursue education. That was what was important for me. But the fact that a court system a government mostly ran by men and have men on the panels of these cases who will never understand the biological, the psychological, the physical, everything that a woman body goes through while having a child to full term. Some of them don't even have them to full term because there's so many complications. But you have a man telling women that, no, you have to deal with this. You have to go through the stress. You have to go through the pain. Your body changes. And I mean, because I you know, like I said, I don't have children. I've never um, um, been pregnant or anything, but friends and even watching my sister-in-law and how things that she went through um, and carrying my niece full term. And that about scared me straight with stuff. I was like, no, I don't ever have to ever, ever, ever do that because just because that's just so messed up but the fact that some women who can't carry their um babies to full term and they end up having miscarriage and the pressure the um that they go through the stress that they go through the depression that they go through thinking that it's something wrong with them men don't understand that but yet you're telling a woman that she has to deal with that and then the man decide in some cases that even if the child is carried to full term that they don't want to stay around to raise the child exactly <laughs> um but you telling me what i need to do with my body what kind of crap is that so I mean, if the I, child does something wrong they want the kid the, the child they to be. go to, i could i could honestly swear so many times i remember growing up and the moment that myself or my brothers and sister did something my father was like where's your mother um you're part of the situation too um so let's talk about that but it, i i it's just so unfair in 2021 i can't believe that we're still talking about this that we're having these conversations and um i appreciate um the district court um in austin Robert Pittman, who uh, came with his harsh language, his criticism, everything, because it, it makes no sense for us to still be having these conversations in 2021 for them to want to regulate a woman's body and tell her what she can do when um, it only takes one man to impregnate several women in one day. And a woman, one woman has to go nine term, nine months for full term for pregnancy. So if you do the math and how much that comes up, I think we need to have conversations with men about, okay, let's cut off your balls then. Let's do that. <laughs> and, and then the conversation changes. You get a little stickler about that. So let's talk about that. But they don't want to have that conversation. Surgical sterilization, okay, that's a little nice or something, okay. <laughs> oh. But in Mexico, yeah, was it last week or two weeks ago that Mexico allowed abortion, right? Yes, they yes they did. Yeah. So, and, and even I think there were some um, a lot of women that were going across the border to other states outside of Texas to get abortions done. And these are these, these are women who are not they don't have money. Yeah. Well, two things come into play here, I think. First of all, <clears throat> you know, people on, on the other side of this debate, listening to someone like Angela, my impression is that they just tune it out. They don't even respond on those terms, or they say something like, it's not your body, there's another body inside of you, and that has to take precedence. Because basically, um, they re reflect the position of the Catholic Church and uh, some other Protestant uh, denominations that life begins at conception and therefore you know anything um any 
termination of a pregnancy at any point in the pregnancy is, you know, a mortal sin, a crime against humanity, etc. Um, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm not saying what hasn't been said hundreds and hundreds of times before. In this society, you have the right to your own religious beliefs. You do not have the right to impose them on other people. And I think part of the, the reason people are so panicked right now about the Supreme Court and where it's going on this is that all six of the conservative justices, Roberts, Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, are all Catholics. And several of them have made it kind of clear that, uh, you know, they have a strong loyalty to the church and its teachings. I, I mean, Barrett came right out of Notre Dame. And I mean, she's like really into this thing of like, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, she's she's a devout Catholic, not just somebody who just says, yeah, I was raised Catholic. No, she really goes the whole nine yards on this thing. And um, it's it's clearly they can deny it until the cows come home, but it is clearly impacting their beliefs. And that's one reason that the Republicans push them on the court with the expectation that they would let their religious beliefs impact their decision in this particular area. Um, the, the, you know, the other thing I would say is that I think, you know, the problem with the way Roe v. Wade was originally decided was that it was I understand the, the arguments for doing it this way, but by setting a single standard for the entire country, it kind of guaranteed that there would be this kind of conflict because obviously a state like New York, the general feeling about uh, reproductive freedom and abortion and so forth, the consensus is there and there's a very different consensus in some place like Texas, although that is changing as we know demographically, but there's still you know this strong and politically um motivated group of people and including some women who are obsessed with the fact that you know abortion must be made illegal uh this is the thing i, I mean obviously if you went back and said well you can't have 50 different you can't let the states all make their own laws uh in an area like this i mean at the very least it would make it difficult it would mean that women in anti-abortion states would have to travel sometimes long distances to um, you know, pro-abortion states, which may happen if the you know Supreme Court upholds the Texas law. Anyway, um, that's a bad situation. But I think that by making this sweeping judgment and saying it's got to be the same for every single state in the union, they kind of open the door to the situation they have now. I don't know what the what the right way to do it. I'm not a lawyer, but I think that's that was kind of at the root of the problem. You know, you've had this. You've had this movement that sprung up in the in the in the wake of Roe v. Wade, and it was censured in many states that were more conservative. And you know, the general philosophy was that uh, no, we want abortion to stay illegal. So um, I don't see a way out of it. I really don't. But you know, we just have to keep hoping that maybe the Supreme Court will kind of do the right thing in this regard. But I'm not I'm not holding my breath. Okay, can I want to interject something? So you you mentioned um, about you know some of the uh, elected officials and Supreme Court folks who are, you know, pushing the the religion envelope and all of that. So are they wanting to continue to have these children so the Roman Catholic Church and all these other people can molest these kids? Because that's the other scandal that came out with all this stuff within the last day. So we just want to keep having babies so the uh, priests can keep molesting them? Because, oh. hey, that's another conversation to have. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you see. Uh, anywhere you have uh, state and state and, uh, and and church, or church and state, you're in trouble because uh, you know, for the same reason, people who actually do not like um, Islam to be uh, to be different, who, who like who want Islam to be different, who think that Islam is so much into uh, into state matters, are the same people who want us to believe this. Kind of, of of crap. I I I have actually I I um uh, an experience with this not because I was uh, I was pregnant, but you know uh, I, when I was young and, and uh, George, that would be a whole, whole another conversation if you was pregnant. So um. and that would be exactly exactly. <laughs> but, we went through we went from one hospital to another hospital to another hospital trying to get. Uh, uh, a doctor would do, a, do do an abortion, and it was kind of traumatic. Um, and I, I'm ever since that time, I'm always, I have always been for abortion. 
because um, because it, it, our lives were changed by by that experience. It was very very traumatic, and uh, I understand when women say, "Listen, it is me who is going through this, so I, let me have the choice of whether I need to carry this kid uh, to term, to full term, or not." Uh, in many cases, most women don't want to actually to abort. Right. Most right. women don't want to abort. It's just in certain cases, very small, special cases where a life is involved. Uh, there's a, there's a, a disease or some, a woman's life is in danger or uh, um, it's just somebody just too young for it. Uh, cases of incest are so many. And the problem with the, with, the, with the church is that church doesn't even look at that. Problems of incest. Of course, you expect people who didn't care about uh, priests uh, you know, molesting uh, children. You don't expect them to care. I mean, this is the same reason Martin. Uh, I mean, I mean Luther led uh, led uh, the uh, the Reformation. Reformation. Yeah, exactly. Because Rome was was uh, full of a lot of uh, bad things that are going on, and, uh, and 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 that has always been the case. And I mean, this is a church that that allows people to drink uh, when the other churches don't. So the, the, the Catholic Church, and my mother is a Catholic Church. Uh, 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 my mother, interesting, was a nun before me. Huh. And, uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> uh, and, and somebody made sure that you know that <laughs> that that should not go on. So um, I have I uh, you kind of had an immaculate conception there, George. <laughs> No, I, I, I wasn't immaculate. <laughs> I wasn't immaculate. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. And I, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I came along and, and uh, she had to leave. So here's the thing. The thing is that uh, I don't understand how some people are supportive of of, of and, and this is uh, the church is not uh, the, the Catholic church is not not on this, but a lot of people within the Catholic church still still to they they would rather you know have a death penalty, although the Catholic church itself does not like death penalty, but there are people within this movement, this Roe v Wade movement, who are con comfortable with the death penalty on adults, but not. Uh, 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 abortion, and they'd rather see a woman who is so unable to raise a kid because of lack of money and because of resources and stuff like that, starve. But all they're concerned about is a baby who has not actually become a baby. You know, they're actually defining people's uh, what what it is to be a human, because nobody has ever defined it. God never defined who is human. And they have abrogated themselves the right to define, oh, this is where life begins, as if the doctors are there. So this is all politics to me. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme, Court Sorry. Is actually, the Supreme Court, I think the Supreme Court is on the verge of, 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 of uh, I don't say destroying the country, but bringing a democratic, um, a crisis in democracy bring about it. Hmm. Yeah, there was an interesting article in today's Times, in fact, by uh, Linda Greenhouse, who covered the Times, uh, the, court, the court for the Times for many years, uh, in which she, she said that, um, I have it open here, um, a poll conducted um, recently around the, uh, the time of the abortion case by the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania and released on Monday found that 34% of Americans agreed with the state statement, if the Supreme Court started making a lot of rulings that most Americans disagreed with, it might be better to do away with the court altogether. Two years ago, when Annenberg last asked that question, only 20% agreed. So clearly, there is a danger that uh, increasingly they are losing all credibility and, and being um, you know, viewed more and more as not impartial at all and just as partisan as the politicians in Congress or the White House. And in fact, uh, in this article, Greenhouse goes on to talk about how some of these justices um, 
like Alito and Barrett have been, you know, whining a lot. And Thomas have been in public statements saying, you know, this is not fair. You know, we we make our decisions based on our judicial philosophy and we stay out of political. Duh. Well, the proof is in the pudding, guys. I mean, that's the thing. If you're you know, going to make these kind of decisions, if you're going to kind of like say that this this extreme, disgusting law um if you do anything short of saying, no, this is unconstitutional, this has to be shut down, then yeah, your credibility will suffer and you will be seen as partisan. And the last thing I'll note about this article is that Greenhouse points out that even 20 years ago, after the Bush and Gore decision, the credibility of the court, there was a lot of you know anger, even outrage about it, but it was more about like they shouldn't have stepped in or they should have, they should have let the counting go on longer. There wasn't, in terms of public uh, polling and perception, a, a real threat to the credibility of the court itself, which is what you're seeing today. So they are going down a very dangerous road here. Right, right. And if you can't trust the Supreme Court, um, somebody told me, you know, if you want to see a failed state, if you want to see a failed state, go to the police force. If people don't respect the police force, that's a failed state because that means laws have been disregarded and nobody can, uh, can abide by them. And in this case, if you, if you don't think that the judiciary is being fair, then what's the hell? Somebody once said, why hire a lawyer if you can <laughs> pay the judge? <laughs> in this case, yeah. Why do we have laws if the, uh, the Supreme Court is deciding everything that wow. they want? Yeah, this is this is this is the crisis I'm talking about because it's going to lead to a loss of faith in the not just the judicial system but the democratic system in the society as a whole, you know, and and so uh, what whatever has up to now separated America from the rest of the world, will never be there. Because if a country was created out of, well, that's a, that's a big discussion, but one thing that is different in America from the other countries is, the law is what uh, brings us all together. Because it is not out of a kingship or or some nation, you know, the nation coming out of ethnic nationality. People here from many different places, of course, starting with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, uh, with, with the, the enslaved. Uh, um, so if we don't respect the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court does not deserve that respect, there's going to be a lot more problems. And the truth, of course, is that the Supreme Court has always had trouble since it's um, since uh, uh, um, Marshall, because there's certain Supreme Court no, uh, courts. So say each each court is different. There's some of them that you know uh, came up with very bad laws, very bad laws. The dress, uh, dress court case you know, still haunts this court. And, and so they have to actually work hard to gain our confidence. And at this point, with Trump or, 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 uh, on, on the sidelines, the truth-based politics is always ignored. It's going to be bad. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, George, you talk about the history of the court. And I mean, if you wanted to take a more cynical point of view, you could say that really starting from, uh, I mean, the, the decisions that <clears throat> most people remember from the, the court's first uh, 100, 150 years are pretty bad ones. I mean, you're right, mm -hmm. Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson, um, some other rulings that I think uh, were about kind of uh, curtailing free speech during uh, World War One, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you really had, and yet at the same time, uh, and maybe this is the fault of the society, but in general, people accepted the court's rulings. And I think they, they still did feel, even if they disagreed with a particular ruling, that the credibility of the court itself um, wasn't at stake. And what happened was that after World War II, when uh, Earl Warren became the chief justice and 
there was an unusually, I should say, liberal court that put out a series of rulings that fundamentally altered our society, Brown versus Board of Education, the Miranda, the um, um, uh, Gideon versus Wainwright, which guaranteed the right to counsel, and finally right. Roe versus Wade. And these were transformational rulings in a way that very few previous rulings had been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this this is where the kind of the court wars began, because conservatives uh, who had been willing to tolerate, you know, liberal justices and, you know, maybe results they didn't always agree with, suddenly got up in arms. They got into panic because, my God, these these rulings are actually changing the way we live. We can see them, okay? It's not some like some obscure ruling on the Commerce Clause here. This is talking about actual rights of groups in this society that we hadn't thought much about in the past. And, you know, ever since then, we've seen the response to that, the creation of the Federalist Society, the politicization of judges. And then, of course, and, and you know, you had... Liberals kind of had to fight back and and do the same thing, so that you know it's 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 been it's been a vicious cycle almost. And I I do think that the record has shown that most of the judges appointed by Democratic presidents in the last four decades um, have made more of an effort at yeah. impartiality than the Republican justices. And yet you still had for a long time Republican justices like Sandra Day O'Connor. Who also uh, oh, you know, made, an, made an effort to be, huh? Yeah, to oh, be oh, very good. I think O'Connor uh, was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, she was a conservative Republican, but she listened to her colleagues. She was open to competing ideas. And that's really the problem now. You have at least, I would say, three or four justices who have their fingers in their ears and are not in ideologues. And now we have ideologues. You know, the, the guys who used the guys who used to keep away from the mainstream are the guys the, the guys who are leading right now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which is another reason why Justice Breyer has got to retire before 2025 because I talk about him. You he know. is but you know I, I I don't understand him. I don't understand him because uh, he should have retired a long time ago. Well, he should retire while a Democratic president is in office. That's what it amounts to, because, Indeed. Uh, you know. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he saw what happened with Ginsburg. And I mean, I don't know what, what kind of fantasy world he's living in if he doesn't think it'll happen again if he retires, you know, if a Republican wins in, in 2024 and he retires in 2025. We know exactly what's going to happen. So. Okay. Exactly. And, and, and you guys probably can speak about this a little bit more than I, because I am so not aware. Why don't we have a limitations on terms for senators, congressmen, judges? Why? Why? Please just tell me. Well, there's no reason why there shouldn't be. Uh, it's just, and it's been it's been batted around, uh, particularly after uh, Barrett's confirmation a month before Election Day last year. Um, and then the idea kind of died out. I mean, I think some people you know, just said like, well, it's, you know, uh, I don't know, it's tradition or something. Once again, this idea that, well, the judges are not like elected officials. They're, they're above that sort of thing. But clearly they're not. I mean, clearly there's no other position in this country where people can serve for life. OK, there's something fundamentally anti-democratic, I think, with that idea. I think the idea of like an 18 year term is a reasonable one. Um, but no, there's nothing in the Constitution or the law that says you can't do it. Right. There's just this kind of backlash that this is too radical a move. But we have a radical court. Sorry, George, you were going to say something. No, you're, you're, you're right. There's nothing. This is just a traditional thing. There are a lot of things that are, we do by, by, by tradition. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the Congress, Congress has the uh, responsibility, the right and uh, uh, the obligation to uh, determine what the Supreme Court can decide on and its constitution, how the Supreme Court is constituted, that's all up to Congress. Congress can do it. The problem, of course, is that uh, it's a political battle. It's not, there's nothing legal about it. Anyway, this has been uh, one of the best uh, discussions we've had about very substantive top topics and issues that are very controversial as well. That's why we are here to talk about issues that affect our culture. And uh, I want to end by um, uh, appealing again. We have a fundraiser going on. We have a matching fund that has been given to us by IOBI. 
And so uh, we want to ask um, our viewers and our listeners to go to iob.org forward slash project forward slash culture road help us reach 5,000. It's going to be on the website. Don't forget to share us, to uh, um, like us, or to subscribe. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>